When it comes to the shape of powder kernels, there are three basic types or morphologies. Ball, flake, and extruded. There are also subtypes and sizes based on these. Solid rods, tubes, square flakes, round flakes, donut-like flakes, irregular flakes, flattened balls, and so on. All are available to a greater or lesser extent as single or double base powders and they all have different burn properties. Some powder types tend to be associated with particular types of firearm. Extruded powders are commonly used in rifles. Ball powders are commonly used in pistols. Flake powders are commonly used in shotguns. However, those statements are by no means a rule of thumb and there's some crossover between the different morphologies and their uses. Some shotgun ammunition is loaded with ball powders. Quite a few pistol calibers can use flake powders and so on. The crucial factor is how rapidly the burning powder develops its pressure and where that pressure peaks. An ideal reaction would be one in which all the powder burns away and finishes doing so just as the projectile leaves the barrel. The reality is quite different. There is often unburnt powder or excess gas or both. Casting our minds way back to part one, we saw how modern small arms powders are usually either single base, nitrocellulose only, or double base, nitrocellulose and nitroglycerin. Well, those are just part of the story. In smokeless powders, nitrocellulose and nitroglycerin are called the energetics, the fuel if you will. But nitro powder has other ingredients to help govern the reaction. Plasticizers, to soften the propellant and make the mixture less hygroscopic. These also reduce the need for volatile solvents in preparing the mixture. Stabilizers to prevent the nitrocellulose and nitroglycerin from decomposing and producing nitric and nitrous acids. Stabilizers enhance the shelf life of the powder. Deterrents are often applied as a coating to the exterior of the kernels. They reduce the ignitability and initial flame temperature. They also help smooth out the pressure peak. Flash suppressants, commonly alkaline earth salts, are used to help diminish visible flash at the muzzle. These may be incorporated into the raw mixture or added as separate kernels. Opacifiers to keep radiant heat from penetrating too deeply into the surface of the kernel and causing detonation. Opacifiers may also enhance the burn rate. Decoppering agents to oxidize copper residue so that it can be removed with other fouling when the bore is cleaned. These are usually bismuth or tin compounds. Dyes are sometimes added for identification purposes. Alliant red dot, blue dot and green dot all have flakes of the appropriate colour mixed in with the powder. And there may also be graphite glaze to improve powder flow and dissipate static, ignition aid coatings to balance surface oxygen, these are common in ball powders, and in artillery powders, glazes to reduce barrel erosion. As mentioned earlier, burn speed is stated in relation to other powders, rather than some form of absolute scale. Online you'll find plenty of comparison charts such as these. Nearly all of them list commercial powders from fastest to slowest. They're a good source of background information, but should not be used to calculate actual loads. We've got reloading manuals for that. In confinement, nitro powder combusts in milliseconds. Burning in the open, all we get is variations on the now very familiar orange flame. Here, in relative terms, we've got a fast flake powder, a medium speed ball powder, and a slow stick powder. They visibly go at different speeds, but the medium powder actually lasts slightly longer than what would be considered the slowest of the three. So simple burning in open air provides no real clue as to how powders will behave in confinement. Powders carry their own oxygen and don't need air to burn. 
When a powder kernel burns, it can do one of three things. Firstly, there's regressive burning. The kernel burns away like a tiny hot coal with the pressure diminishing as its surface area decreases. Regressive burning is typical in ball powders or stick powders without a central hole. Then there's neutral burning. This would be the case for stick powders with a hole down the middle. Burning from both inside and out, these powders produce a steady rate of hot gas, allowing pressure on the bullet to be maintained as it travels down the barrel. And finally, we have progressive burning. This is more usual in artillery powders which have large kernels with multiple holes. With all those little holes alight, the available surface area actually increases during the reaction, resulting in climbing pressure. Keeping track of commercial powders can be a confusing exercise. Over 200 powders are marketed to shooters. Not all are available everywhere in the world, and they're always evolving. Some are discontinued, new ones are added. Some competing brands are manufactured at the same factories and over the years powder companies have seen multiple acquisitions and mergers. Powders come and go but some have been around for a very long time with tweaks and changes made over the years to their formula. The names you see here have been around for many decades with Unique and Bullseye going back well over a century. Certain powders have different branding and names, but are actually identical. Conversely, other powders have almost identical names, but are actually quite different. H4895 is slightly faster than IMR4895, so beware. In all cases, if you're loading your own ammunition, always use either an officially published reloading manual or online data supplied by the powder manufacturer. It's also a good idea to check more than one source. Never load cartridges based on internet forums or word of mouth. I once asked a very experienced reloader what a good load for 44 Magnum was and was told 9 grains of green dot. Some time later when I got hold of some green dot and started developing a load, I found the maximum book load for the type and weight of bullet I was using, the load you should never exceed, was actually just 7 grains. Good thing I checked. Start at the bottom recommended load and then work slowly and methodically upwards. If only one value is stated as on the outside of some powder cans, it will often be a maximum load and will say so clearly on the can. However, it's actually better to work from a book in the first instance. Commercial powders are sometimes called canister powders. That's because they're packaged in canisters of different sizes, normally in weights of up to 8 pounds. But ammunition manufacturers design their own powders for each type of ammunition they produce. These are known as non-canister powders and are usually acquired in lots of several tons. These are a completely different animal to canister powders because their properties will vary from lot to lot. They are bought, mixed and tested to meet a given spec and the content or mixture may be different each time. It's less common now for surplus non-canister powders to get into the supply chain but if you should come across these, proceed with extreme caution it's really best to stick with commercially branded powders. Generally, the composition of non-canister powders is kept under wraps, but occasionally a manufacturer will standardize and release a commercial powder based on what was originally a non-canister type. Despite their ingredients, modern nitro powders are very stable indeed and can be stored for a long time without issue. However, they are highly flammable, so there are some sensible precautions to take in storing them. The rules will vary according to jurisdiction, but in the UK we're required to store powders in heavy plywood boxes like these. Their construction, incorporating partitions and an inner lid or intumescent seal, give a few minutes extra protection in case of fire. The normal odour of fresh powder is somewhere between pear drops and bleach, 
or a bit like a school chemistry lab. If you should encounter a tub of old powder that has a foul acidic smell or is giving off brown fumes, it should be disposed of at once and well away from people or animals. Check the wind direction and stay upwind or you might get singed. Deposit a small amount, a mugful or less, then put the container well out of the way with the lid on and ignite the powder at arm's length. A word of caution, never ignite powder while it's still in its container. This might happen. Although the flame was only visible some of the time, that rushing sound was a continuous jet of scalding hot gas extending some eight feet above the mouth of the container. The other thing that could happen is this. In both these demonstrations, we used no more than four ounces or a hundred grams of powder, and not all of it burned. These scenes were filmed under carefully controlled conditions with the powder ignited electronically. There were no lids on the containers and yet there was enough pressure to burst one of them. In fairness to the manufacturers, although the powder we used in those scenes was a good few years old, it hadn't deteriorated in the slightest. Modern powders are very robust indeed. Major General Julian S. Hatcher was an American former army officer and noted firearms expert. Despite being written just after World War II, his Hatcher's notebook is a goldmine of information. Powder names and types may have changed, but the laws of physics haven't. If you buy this book, be sure and get this 1962 third edition. You can only get it second hand, but it has some sections that are missing in this 2012 reprint. The third edition has a part two at the end featuring some intriguing accounts, including the following hair-raising tale about bulk powder storage. J. Bushnell Smith was a well-known gunsmith and custom ammunition loader from Vermont. In July of 1948, General Hatcher was called to the scene of a fatal accident involving Smith. Apparently, in Smith's workshop, there had been five 150-pound drums of powder. Smith was in the habit of test-firing guns through the window above his bench. He'd been checking the trigger on a rifle and had an accidental discharge. The bullet struck one of the large containers in his storeroom, setting off all 750 plus pounds of powder. The sudden blaze had cooked Smith before he could move and dropped him in his tracks. Well, provided that hasn't put you off for life, in the final part of this series we'll take a closer look at powders in use for different types of ammunition and what to do when you've made a goof. Yeah.